good good afternoon it is i think it's 12 o'clock your time uh this, uh, this thank you for the introduction I, I can be passionate about it because i see so many people doing really stupid stuff but and and that is often the reason for my talks uh microservices and databases and um i i also well my real life is riding around on a motorcycle and i have been about 700 kilometers from moscow once when i was in the baltics uh between uh, narva and doga pills was on the russian border and i sort of said hello to you guys i'll visit one day i'll try i promise the agenda for this one is uh it used to be about 45 minutes i think i have an hour i don't mind questions um and if there are a lot of questions pop me halfway through or i'll keep them to the end i know it can be controversial and i it's no joke i learn more from the audience asking questions than you could possibly learn from me don't don't hesitate put questions in. Um, do i have to go through history of microservices i'll keep it simple microservices the main thing is they are decoupled they are sort of standalone items somewhere uh, and microservices have a problem with state state is a huh i need to store something yep you need to store something I have a few ideas. Uh, you'll end up with three classifications and an A and a B. Um, I've put in a lot of Postgres references because it is a Postgres uh, conference. But the things I will explain in this <coughs> in this talk are probably applicable to other databases. And one of the conditions for a good database system is that it can do user-defined functions or user-defined procedures. If you can have a stored procedure in your database, you're halfway through creating a microservice. Maybe it's a bit of a short conclusion, but you'll find that PL PG SQL is important. Uh, Oracle does that with PL SQL. A lot of you probably know it, and, and if you hate Oracle, don't worry, I'll, I'll try not to mention it too often. And there are new, new databases on the block. YugaDB and CockroachDB pretend to be clustered databases. Uh, I'm not going into their concept or their their, uh, their topic too much, but uh, if you can run something on Postgres, you may find it fairly easy to port it to something like YugaByte or Cockroach. That is going to be an interesting development in the future. <laughs> you can see I added it. There's a typo. No, apologies for that. Um, and yes, I hope there's a bit of time for discussion. So keep your questions. Microservices, um, when I learned about them, I thought they were a, a great concept. And I also had a bit of a, a deja vu because microservices are just really complicated, large objects. And we have to have, we used to have objects uh, somewhere in the mid nineties, object oriented programming, anyone. You, you may find some of the concepts come back. Microservices are about about decoupling, so about having independent items doing work for you. And when, when you come across that, you, you should probably Google the solid principles as well. The solid principles come from the object-oriented uh, theory practice attempt in the 90s and the early 2000s. And some of that stuff applies to microservices. Microservices are currently sold as, you know, they're scalable because we can start a thousand of them. And that's why they, they represent it here like the virus a little bit. You know, microservices are like a virus and they have a really high replication factor. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not going to advocate any vaccine yet, but maybe. Uh, microservices, uh, the serverless people are wild about microservices because you don't need a server anymore. You don't need a hardware you don't need to configure it you don't need to cook your file system etc you just deploy on kubernetes so where's kubernetes running uh, microservices of course are agile and very much into devops microservices can be deployed on something like kubernetes uh, on a lambda in aws on a function in microsoft it's a, an on-demand principle in many cases Amazon will say it's pay as you go. If you need a thousand microservices, you can start a thousand microservices. Uh, I think something's going to melt, at least your credit card. Uh, microservices are very hip and trendy, so be careful with that. I found a lot of good ideas in microservices, but now you've got people running around with a, a big word microservice on their front head. Going, hmm. 
And uh, the, the sucker is, of course, a microservice. It's still an IT program. It, it's, it's software and it needs data. At some point, your microservice will need state or a state machine or store something. It may have to write to a file, to an object or to a database. So the elephant in the room, the, the big item coming in always is that database. If you want to, anything you've done, you want to keep it, you probably need to store it in a database or some object store. And um, this guy, this, uh, Vlad, is in charge of the Java Hibernate software. If you have a, a serious microservice architecture, you probably need a database. You may have to need a database per service. That's a nightmare. Well, he formulated it differently. He said, frankly, I'm not sure how that can work in reality, as more databases mean more monitoring, more backup, more security, more replication, more tuning, more DBAs. Yeah. So here's the challenge. If you multiply your microservices, how are you going to keep up with your data store, your, your database? And of course, uh, this is Postgres, so I'd, I'd call the database the elephant in the room. Hello, Slonik. Uh, and everybody knows databases are a problem or used to be. But most microservices are just known as a URL. Here's the URL, you call it. So, and that, that thing is running somewhere in a cloud. You don't need to know whether it's on Kubernetes or on a virtual machine or in a function. You just call the microservice. Uh, you give it a get to get some information. You give it a post or a put to store something. You can see the problem coming. If you put a post into the microservice, your, the microservice is supposed to keep the data. It is already assuming a state machine. Keep something, save it, back it up. So if you have some application component, you probably also need a database or a data store. And of course, you can, you can choose object stores and put everything in buckets or in glaciers or what have you but you still need to store it somewhere. And by the way, the best place to store it, of course, a database. I don't need to tell you guys that. The sequence of activities in a microservice will generally be something like you call it or somebody calls the microservice. And then the microservice needs something to work with, a database. And it may have to look up something in a database. It might have to save and return something to the database. You can already see that a single microservice call results in a chatty talk between the service itself and its object store, its database. And of course, you want to avoid returning four or 500 errors. You don't want page errors or server errors. So we have to figure a way to, to have to build a microservice that uh, does something with data and doesn't return errors. Here's the challenge. And of course, there's a Always, the database is the problem. Everybody knows the database is the problem. Everybody knows databases are slow. Um, so thinking about it and, and listening to the, the hype guys for microservices, there are about three cases. There is the easy case, the simple case, and the difficult case. Um, the easy part is if you have a, a program that can run totally standalone, I, I, I call that data is null. There is no data. Uh, doesn't need any state at all. Immediately, there's a question mark. How can a useful program not have or need or use state? There's always state somewhere. But for example, if you want to calculate Celsius to Fahrenheit or Kelvin, you know that you maybe have an ideal microservice. It is simple, but a very rare case. Most microservices will need some sort of state. If you're lucky, it's read only. So you have something that's almost stateless. You, um, <clears throat> you don't have to return. The, your database doesn't have to receive any data. You don't have to store anything. You don't have to worry about something like a commit and a save and a backup. Uh, examples of that are catalogs, uh, zip code lookups, postcode lookups, uh, list of values, the, the eternal list of 200 countries that you need to produce in a pick list. The R for Russia is all the way to the back of the alphabet, so you keep scrolling. Um, but a read-only microservice might still need a database, or it needs some place to read data from. It needs a read store. 
The more difficult one, and probably the more common one, is a stateful microservice or a stateful system. You need to store something, and it has to be either completely asset or at least base. You know, basic availability, safe, uh, eventual, <laughs> eventual consistent, and the eventual is the big question. Uh, you need a database, for example, if you do stock keeping, you want to know how much is in stock. So you take something out and you update the total, or you make sure somebody can verify the amount of stock that is in there. You need updates. You, uh, you need the elephant in the room, a database. Uh, number one is easy, number two is doable, number three becomes a problem in many cases. Let's have a look. Have a standalone microservice, you're just executing something, for example, you, you divide by minus 32 and divide by 7 or something, create Celsius and Kelvin. You can format a string or do something something clever with CSS. You, you can compress a file. Already, the compressing of a file, you probably need some sort of state. You need to receive your file, process it, and send it back. There's always data involved somewhere. Uh, but if you can say you have no data, I would say, so you don't need any extra components. You don't need extra connections. You have a fairly small program. You can containerize it, run it in Kubernetes, off you go. You know, I'd be tempted to ask everyone in the class, you know, build a Celsius to Kelvin converter and deploy it in Kubernetes. Uh, but you can deploy something like that quite simple. You can scale it out forever. You can start a thousand instances with no problem because they don't hurt one another. They won't choke on some sort of choke point. If that's your challenge, you're lucky. You have a microservice. You are buzzword compliant, totally. Um, your application probably looks like this. Yes, you can scale. So standalone, completely isolated microservice is beautiful, but, and I, I won't challenge the usefulness of a calculator, but it is a, relatively minor part of IT. The uh, read-only microservices, a bit more complicated because you need data. Your system needs to have the list of countries, the zip code lookup, the catalog data. There are a lot of image stores out there for web shops. And that is static data. It doesn't update a lot. And you, you can replicate that data if you like, as long as you know where you're going. Your choices for a microservice that needs a limited amount of read-only data. So your serve your choice for a microservice that just needs to present data are to include the data in the microservice or to call out to pick up the data. Including it means your microservice becomes totally independent. There's no external call, no connection needed to get the data. Calling out means you have to find it somewhere. If you include your data in your microservice, you, the data may become outdated. Timeliness is a problem. If the catalog is no longer valid, if you have an image of a, a 1980 Lada or so, you know, you're probably not selling 1980s cars anymore. So how old is your data set and can you live with that? If you include your data, your microservice becomes fat. And they call it, oh, this is a very fat container. Yeah, it's a fat container because it has a lot of data in it that is readily available for presentation. It does mean your microservice becomes a bit slow on startup. It means it becomes a bit slow on deployment if it has to go to the other side of the world for some Cloudflare system. Right. So if you decide, I have a, a smaller microservice and I'll call out to find my data, that's fine. But calling out to pick up data means you need effort, you need time, latency, and you end up with something called a chatty protocol. And your network has to be able to handle it. And by the way, who are you getting the data from? Database? Now that might become a bottleneck because if a thousand microservices suddenly call up to find the image of your product, you know, the database runs a bit hot. And your microservice now becomes coupled to something else. And that's probably less preferable, but it's a solution. You'd have to weigh the pros and cons. In drawings, I would say you either have a microservice, the virus with the data attached to it, or you have a bunch of microservices calling out to read data from a database. 
And, uh, I don't know if I put slow dig in there, but you know, slow dig might get busy if you get a thousand microservices calling up for data, but it may work. Ah, there he is. He's an elephant. He can handle something. If you have a stateful service, you need to save something. So you're updating uh, a bank account, the extreme one. You're updating stock in a warehouse. You need to save that somewhere. You probably end up with a lot of microservices and a really big database. Um, you want to keep data. You have a single point of truth or a system of record. In, in the old school, you need a state machine. And that, that would be the case for order taking, keeping stock, or doing payments. It's important that you know what your amount is and where you stored it, and, and don't lose track of the amount. I, I remember how much I have in stock. And I don't want your number to be different from the stock that I have in my warehouse. Uh, you have a limited choice. You need to call some kind of storage. And it, it, has, it probably has to be asset. For stock keeping, I don't want my base uh, eventual consistency stuff, really. So there's a consideration of, am I of can I afford data loss? And what is the cost if I lose something? Can I afford that? Uh, how quick do I need an answer? And in database land, we're used to something like a 10 millisecond reply on a query. Uh, a lot of microservices will take uh, hundreds of milliseconds, if not a second, to reply with something. That can be a problem. If you have a lot of microservices, capacity immediately is a problem. So how much traffic can you handle? And if you send too much traffic to a critical component, the database, it'll melt down or it'll generate errors. You probably don't want that. So later on in the presentation, I will argue you need a, a safety valve or a throttling mechanism to prevent overload. And you'll need that anyway, regardless of what kind of microservice you do. Uh, and then if errors occur, you have to sort of gracefully handle the error. The typical example of a graceful, graceful error handling was the, the fail whale in Twitter years ago. I haven't seen that one in a bit. <laughs> Every now and then, I still see a 1555 error. Um, but you need a database. For anything stateful, you'd have to consider a database or an object store or some place where you put data. And in most cases, that's probably going to be uh, an RDBMS or a relational data model. I hope. But this is part of the discussion, because a lot of people will come in and say, oh, you know, we use object store. And that's fine. Or we have this uh, Mongo key value thing, and it works for us. And if, if it works for you, I'm happy with that. But I, I kind of choose an RDBMS. Um, I come from a mechanical background, hence the, the T Ford. And we always use an automotive equivalent. You know, oh, you don't buy that kind of car. Engineering rule of thumb. Minimize your components. Make sure you can do everything with just five components. That's easy. You can have components in reserve. You know how the component works. You can fix it. You can replace it. If you need a lot of components, try to minimize the different number of components. So do everything with a, an M13 bolt, for example. And then you only need one bolt and one socket. And, and it's repairable with just the one socket and the one bolt. Easy. In database land, in IT land, you probably still want to minimize your number of microservices because it's easier to, to monitor and to control 10 microservices than 1,000. Although, you know, real fanatics will say, oh, it scales, no problem. I can start 1,000. Yep. Amazon will love you for that. Um, if you use just a single database, you end up with a monolith. And in my opinion, that's fine as long as you can keep the monolith healthy. Um, and if you need to scale out, well, you have all the considerations in this PowerPoint. Um, if you do have to multiply your number of databases, try at least using the same one. So if you're using Postgres as a backend uh, repository, as, a, as your point of truth, maybe your microservices should also use Postgres. It's just easier that way. And you end up with the CQRS model, which is debatable. Maybe put that in the discussion for later on. Was CQRS a good idea? And does it help with microservices? And someone will say yes, and somebody else will say no, maybe not. So microservices and databases, I will try to um, nudge the architect into using uh, something simple, 
something solid. You know, go back to the object-oriented approach. And uh, if you need uh, an, an, an analogy, this is my favorite analogy, the Lada. And, and in France, I of course, I use the, the De Chevaux, and in England, I'll use some English car. But uh, that Lada, it might break, but it will never die. I think you guys can relate to that. There's your microservice again. If you have to add data to your microservice, there's a database. Uh, the decoupling, remember we need decoupled microservices. Remember we need them scalable, we need them fast. We need to be able to start a hundred of them, maybe not a thousand, but a lot. Um, you have to fit, if you have to fit your data in your container, because container people like to have the container totally independent. So they'll pick up the data. And that's possible if you don't have too much data. You can store a gig. Uh, a gigabyte is a difficult number, but maybe your container can be can store something in the area of a single gigabyte. You can choose to put that in comma-separated file-like objects. You can have associated arrays right into your code if you'd like to. Um, I'll make the case <clears throat> that if you want a small database in a microservice, you, you could have SQLite. This is what I look into the audience. Anyone use SQLite here ever? And then some people will go, yep, I did that. And do you like it? And some liked it and some didn't. SQLite is a database. You can use SQL. You can use views. You can even define functions if you find out how to do that. Um, it's a database. It'll work. I'm not saying it's a very high quality, reliable database, but for read only, it's probably good enough. You can use Postgres in your microservice, which in my opinion is still lightweight because you can deploy Postgres still in megabytes. You don't need gigabytes of software to deploy Postgres. It's fine. Uh, you could pick up Oracle, the free version, if you don't want to complete, if you don't want to pay Oracle, that is the XE variety. Uh, you do that, you end up with a fat container, a multi-gigabyte container at least. So be careful with that, but it'll work. If you do it, you have to complete PL SQL in there, for example. You can do fairly complicated stuff inside that database. So sometimes I, I can recommend it. But I'm, I'm a bit careful because it's too big, too fat, and nobody likes Oracle. So go back one, one option and, and highlight Postgres with a big highlighter. Um, the, the gist of this one, and I'll repeat that probably 17 times, your database can be smart. You can do a lot of work at the data, at the database level, close to the data. And it's easier to bring your code to the data than to suck all your data into your service and process it at some remote location. It's just easier to process close to the data than it is to process far away in a microservice deployed into South America or something. Your choice, yeah. and this is your. Ah, yeah, this is. Well, I, I like my animation, so I would argue you can take the microservice and slide it into a database, sort of. And this is why the intro says, you know, maybe your database is your microservice at some point in time. There's two keywords to keep in mind, apart from the database and Slonic. Uh, your database can do a lot of work for you. SQL is a processing mechanism. Views and PLPG SQL are effectively code, can do your work for you. So bring your code to the data. And the other one is uh, a database can handle much more than just tables. Everybody thinks of, at a database, they think of the Northwind example or the employee department type of thing or table with orders and a table with product and a table with customer, that's fine. If your data consists of JSON documents, docs, uh, geographical data, graph data, you can still store that in the database. Now, don't discard Postgres because it is a relational database. It'll handle JSON, it'll handle geographical data, it'll handle graph data, it'll probably handle any data you throw at it. And the advantage of putting something in your database is enormous because your database can easily be backed up, it can be recovered, it can be replicated. You get a lot of information, you get a lot of intelligence if you use a database. And you will miss that if you go to something like Mongo uh, or Elasticsearch. Those are more or less single purpose data store utilities. They're probably not asset 
and because they're single purpose or uh, single task single single item they're not as flexible as a proper database would be i don't i'm not going to put that point too hard but you know you need a database if you're not using a database you're doing it wrong keep that in mind though and uh, you and the next guy said oh but the database is a monolith and that's true we'll, we'll handle that you know we'll learn how to deal with that the i stole this from oracle the oracle presentation is once you have that database there you can put all your intelligent stuff in there and you can store your database your docs your graphs your blobs your geographical information everything goes into that database and you know where it is all of a sudden we, we currently have a customer with MySQL, Postgres, Elasticsearch, and uh, not Mongo, but uh, Cassandra. And the disaster recovery exercise is a nightmare because those four data store components never recover to the same point in time, of course. Uh, so if you got read only data, I'll still argue you need a database instead of a file system. You put your database in your microservice and you end up with a microservice and a data component attached to it. SQLite, and this is why I look into the room, but there's nobody looking back. Um, if SQLite is too lightweight for you, you can consider deploying Postgres and put your logic in PLPG, uh, PLPG SQL. Uh, Postgres stored procedure is maybe not quite PLSQL, there's a few things about the compile and stuff, but we'll get there. You can code your logic in PLPG SQL, and that becomes your program. Your PL SQL P Postgres will fit into a container if you have to, and there you have it. You can consider Oracle, you end up with a big, big fat container. Um, you can consider using something like Postgres and do REST calls to your database. And you probably end up with two containers in that case, but it's still easily deployable. And, and two light containers rather than bit, one big one if you compare it to PLC. Uh, whatever you do, you have to think of reducing calls to and from other components. Your microservice has to be as independent as possible. <clears throat> so if your microservice needs to call out to the database, if between the two here, between the virus and the database, you have a lot of chat. That, that takes up time, that becomes a risk. Um, in Oracle, they'll say you need to reduce context switches, which is another way of saying don't be chatty. And uh, if you want to know more about that, there are the, the hashtags SmartDB and ConvergeDB. Uh, you have to filter out the Oracle PR, but the basic idea is good. You process close to your data and you store all your data in, a, in one or in a similar, um, component the database slonic where's where's slonic uh, microservices you can multiply microservices and databases as well there you go so poll time um we'll put this in the question marks later on but uh, normally I, I try to find out who likes plc who likes sqlite and then you go, yeah you either you like it you avoid it or you go huh or did good nope i don't huh what is sqlite if uh, i had this in march or so i got about seven reactions oh thank you for telling me about sqlite but i guess the audience here already knows sqlite if you have state in a microservice the easy part is you don't have state so you have the standalone program the read only state is you have to choose whether you take your data into your microservice or you have your microservice call out that is your architectural choice, if you like. If you have a stateful microservice, you need data, you need some sort of asset database. And that is the biggie, the big database. Ah, Slodic. Um, I think I made the point already, if you want to, if you need data, use a database. In case of Postgres, use Postgres. If you have that asset data in the database, so you've chosen to use a database, you might as well make it smart. Uh, you can put the database close or behind your microservice and then make sure it doesn't get chatty. Um, you need some sort of overload prevention mechanism. You need a fail whale that effectively says elegantly, 
Mm, I'm too busy now, you know, please excuse me, here's the error. And then if you have a proper overload prevention mechanism, you'll find that things might scale out, but not your database, because it, it remains a single point of truth. I'm very curious to see how um, things like Cockroach and YugaDB are going to handle extreme loads or single points of truth at some point in time. Because database, by definition, is a choke point. Uh, again, Spart and Converge, put everything, put as much as you can inside that database. It's more efficient. In most cases, that's more efficient. It's still, it's, it's your choice as the architect or as the business person. You know your, you, you know your problem domain, you know your data. You can decide what you put in the, in, in, in the hot database, single point of problem, or what you distribute out into your microservices uh, into the big wide world. And remember, if you send a microservice to Brazil with a bunch of data in it, the data will be out of date at some point in time. The picture that I've, the whiteboard for that one is generally this. You have a standalone microservice. It's just there. There is no connection between the service, between the virus and the database with all the truth in it. If you have read only data, you can choose to bring small databases with your microservice or connect your microservices to your big bad database. It's a light coupling. And if you do this well, you do it uh, in a non-chatty way. Make sure you don't have to do thousands of calls to, to get a single answer to a customer. Uh, if you need to store asset data, you need to be sure that whatever the user enters is stored, like my hotel reservation, you know, please keep that safe and, and make sure it is there when I get to the hotel. If you need asset processing, your coupling is, is hard. Your microservice has to have a stateful connection to the database or a REST call with a proper reply. Uh, they are inevitably linked to the data and there is inevitably a single point of truth and possibly a choke point i would argue if you have that you can consider moving this the code into stored procedures and process as much as you can inside that database and it, this is the big discussion point of course do we want to have our processing truly inside the database or, or not and for asset and important processes i would say seriously consider putting your stuff in the database there's a bunch of loose ends of course um, if you truly have a stateless database do you really need an rdbms and because you know, people will say oh i'll put my stuff in uh, amazon buckets and i'll pick it up when i need it or i'll put it in object store and i'll i'll query that when i need it or I, i'll http get it when i need it um, yes but if your data, if you want your data to be efficient, it's probably a bunch of tables and you don't want to store everything a hundred times. There is old wisdom of logic, like joins and views in code that probably belong into your, in your database. So if you want to do, uh, if you have to process data after picking it up, you have to think again, maybe you could have done that processing closer to the place where the data is stored. You know, queries and logic and the power of SQL are still important. Um, if you distribute your data, you might end up with something called CQRS. This is where you look into the rooms. Anyone still using or familiar with CQRS? Mm -hmm. uh, command query response system. Effectively, CQRS is a bunch of read-only data copies, read-only copies of your original, and you do the querying from the read copy, and you only go to the, the source, only go to the base when you need to do an update. It, it complicates your software, in my opinion, but it's usable, and it, it's more or less, uh, probably more or less proven technology. If you have an asset data store, I'll say this again, you need to be able to throttle it to protect it. You need a safety valve. It comes down to limiting the number of connections or limiting the busyness of the connections. Uh, in Java, limit your pool size. Make sure your pool size cannot grow to a disastrous number. And whatever the number is, is up to you. But if you have a, a hundred 
microservices and each of them opens a Java connection pool with 50, you know, 5,000 connections to a database, in my opinion, is a lot, is probably the limit of what I can handle. Um, you have to protect against overload. That counts for the database. That probably also accounts for your deployment repository, for your, your other components. At some point in time, something will melt. And you'd like to know that in advance. And you'd like to be able to give an elegant error rather than something like a 404 not found or 1555 rollback too small or that, you know, vacuum errors. Um, if you need serious scaling, you, you'd have to look at something called New SQL. The products that I know currently are Yugabyte and CockroachDB. They pretend to be able to handle a very huge load of data processing and connections. Um, I still have to discover them. I think Yugabyte seriously looks promising, and I know a couple of people who went to work there. Um, it, it's technically cool, really. Have a look at it. Um, the, the, the last loose end is always you have to know, you have to monitor what's happening to your system. You need metrics, probably more than just a count. You know, doing a count of the transaction table is, is a nice way of knowing how busy you were. You probably want a little bit more information. Make sure that whatever you build, a microservice or a database or anything, make sure you have a measurement system of how it's been used what kind of trends, what kind of usage, and that you are able to evaluate what your users do with it. You know, uh, a zip code lookup system might get abused to verify street names or something like that. You, know, you, find, you will find in practice that your users are not using your system the way you thought they did, but they're doing something with it that you never expected. Your monitoring, your measurements should be able to find that out. You will find that a component will melt that you hadn't expected, like your network is your bottleneck rather than your database. You'd like to have the measurement in place to know that. And that, that is something that tends to get forgotten in microservices. People just deploy them, and then when they don't work, they don't know where to look because we don't know. Effectively, monitoring is missing in a number of cases. <laughs> I'm going to repeat my main message. This is where the consultant in me looks at the watch of the customer, and then I'll tell him the time. Um, state is important. It generally is. So if you have state, consider processing in a database. Use a database if you can. Whatever you do, minimize your calls and reduce your chattiness. In a cloud world, in a microservices world, the communication between the components is probably your a, even a bigger problem than storing your data. And chattiness, uh, latency, in my opinion, is, is going to be the next the problem of the next couple of years. Um, you have to be able to maintain your components, so simplify maintenance, create identical components, and don't deploy a thousand of them if you can help it. Less components is always better. If you can use stored procedures, I would say do so. And you will find, by using stored procedures, you, your database becomes your microservice. That was the, tight, the original title of the talk, even. Your database is your microservice. Uh, if you build stored procedures, make sure that the other components around them, the calling components, have to be as lightweight as possible, because those you will deploy. And your procedure will do the work. And whatever you call your procedures, make it one single call and return the result, if possible, in one round trip is much more efficient. Um, if you have to mitigate the monolith, you have to find a way to prevent overload. Throttling is the word the English use. You have to be able to put a, an end, a pipe somewhere so that no one can overload your critical components. And that throttling, in my opinion, has to be at the application level. I'd, I'd hate to return a funny database level when I, when I get overloaded. Um, if you end up with an overload type of problem, you can consider read copies and do get calls to read copies to the CQRS sort of comes back in again. The one analogy here that I've stolen from the French, you may know this guy. He carries large boulders around, 
And he goes to a place, picks up a rock, and carries it back to his home. I would say, take the tools, go to the rock, and work at the rock. You know, this is, uh, the French recognize it immediately. I'm not sure if you have this in Russia, but I, I think you know Asterix. Rather than carry that rock to your application, you know, take the application and bring it to the rock. It's lighter, really. Those tools are lighter than that rock. Uh, they used to call that smart DB. Now we call it converge DB. Uh, I will say, bring your code to your data. I, I forgot to check my time. I'm probably way early. Uh, we have interesting times ahead. The uh, I'm quite curious how the micro the microservices will develop because a lot of the micros have now discovered we can't really store our data, and a lot of microservices grow to to containers of multiple gigabytes and then become a deployment problem. Uh, the new SQL databases that pretend to shred and shard everything, the distributed databases, that is probably going to be my point of attention for the next couple of years. I'm really curious how that will develop. Um, there are many new systems out there, and I, I'm really interested in, you know, find me over coffee, but if you guys are all over Russia, I'm in the Netherlands, it's a bit difficult to have coffee together. but. Uh, I'd like to hear what you think of all this, and uh, we should discuss. I am quite curious to see what kind of a microservice we'll have next year. Don't take my word for everything. Always read the manuals. In case of doubt, simplify. Uh, Google for simple DBA. Okay. You can find me on Twitter. You, you, can, you can flame me on Twitter, but if it becomes too bad, I'll block. No, I never did that. Um, there's this German guy who said that simplicity shows the master. And I'm sure you have an equivalent proverb in Russian. You know, if, if we were in a in a face-to-face -face meeting, you could tell me and I could write it down. Questions, reactions, you know, should be. I think I'm going to pop my screen share away and read the questions. How do you want to do this? Oh, well, we'll actually help you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thanks. Uh, th th thank you, uh, uh, Piet. Uh, that was like, uh, as usual, a very intensive talk, uh, and uh, you're right on time. Uh, that uh, uh, rhyme in Russian can be literally translated like uh, "shortiness is the sister of the talent." <laughs> shortiness is the sister of the talent. Short shortness is the system of ah. Shortness so is the sister of talent. So like, like, like if you explain something very short and very yeah. simple, it's like um, um, means you are very talented. Uh, Can you write that down? I, I want to keep that. Yeah, oh, thanks. I, I sent it to you. <laughs> thanks. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So basically, um, the first question is, um, uh, we have uh, microservices. And then we are talking about microservices. We're usually talking about container and all the ecosystem around the containers. Yeah. Uh, some times ago, uh, we used to tell uh, people that containers are the thing which is designed for something very unstateful, yeah. stateless. Uh, and now we are, tell, are telling people that we are putting something very stateful, a database inside yeah. the container. Uh, what is your opinion? Are actually the containers uh, database ready already, <laughs> or not yet? Um, the, 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 the question is exactly on the topic of the presentation. And uh, I think my sound bite now is, uh, I, I am okay if you put read-only data in your container. So I'm okay with that, but only if it's not too fat. And, and you'd have to find out what is a practical container size for an image size for your container. And I, you, we used to say it has to be below the gigabyte. As long as your data is a limited amount of data, and small is a relative because 10 years ago a megabyte was big and now a gigabyte is average and a terabyte is big. As long as your data is limited and read only, I'm okay that you put it in a container and distribute it. And then the warning is, of course, if your data is time dependent, that's riskful. You'd have to cycle that container every 12 hours just to make sure you get the fresh data, for example. But, but I'm okay with 
read state with, with information in the container. I am less okay with something like a stock keeping number in the container. So I, I wouldn't save persistent data in the container. I would send it to a monolith or to a safe place somewhere. Is that a relevant? Is that a you yeah, it's, it's around that because uh, in addition from my side, uh, for example, our next speaker usually used to say people that uh, that's no difference. Just put data into container. It's like uh, it's ready. <laughs> so, but uh, I personally been a, a bit more old school, and I probably share your point of view in this regard. <laughs> um, your, your, conta your container will die. You know, your container is disposable in theory. So you can't save anything in your container. No, oh, you you can yeah. use the outside disks. Yeah. Probably. Yes, correct. Mounted disks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another question is uh, for databases. For years, we use like very specific, efficient, performance efficient um, connection pullers. Yeah. Like um, some of them in Java, uh, Oracle Listener is in some regard a good connection puller in postgres yeah. we use pg balance or sometimes we use pg pool or odyssey um is is there a need to have something more universal to use such a microservice architecture from the database point of view do we lack enough such tool uh and if we do how it's supposed to look like I, uh, uh, the honest answer is I don't know, um, but I will, because a database can only handle so many connections. There is a limit number of CPUs under your database component. So, and, and that determines how much calls it can do in a second. And your one of the errors in microservices when they deploy Java components is that the Java connection pool is by default at 20 or 50 and it creates those connections and they sit there idle and the, and the container or the, the component only uses one connection ever and it has 49 idles that that's a total waste of resource please don't do that um if you try to bundle those connections no let, let me rephrase so your microservice has to have the discipline to not create too many connections that's probably lesson number one don't create idle connections. Pooling in a microservice is less relevant if your microservice only has one thread or one CPU available. It can only ever use one process anyway. So it, should, it shouldn't need a pool. Is that part of the answer? Maybe yeah, it is. it is. And the other thing is, on uh, is, is PG Bouncer and, and uh, server-side connection pools are uh, become the responsibility of the database and we need to you guys know more about this than I do but I am not in favor of pooling on the database side I would much rather you do a, a quick call over an open connection so have the connection open do a call wait for the answer then to to do a call and have to uh, activate a server-side mechanism to find another connection or to find an idle thread on my server. It, it would be an extra layer of overhead of finding a, a process or finding a connection or finding a state object to execute my code and return the result. I, I would rather not have pooling on the server side. But this, this is, there are people who know more about this than I do. So maybe the PG Bouncer team doesn't agree at all. But is that, does that mean something? You have to have a microservice that does one call, or you have to have a program, period, that does one call, uses that connection until it gets the result, and that's it. And for efficiency reasons, you probably want to keep the connection open. One day we might come to a point where connections can be created so fast that you can actually close the connection. But there's, there's more to that. I, I realize not a complete answer, but that's about what I have to say before I start saying nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's actually uh, a very interesting question because uh, in Postgres world, many people are coming from um, high-performance web services, high-performance web, and they're 
there is a general very suspicious attitude towards the persistent connection to the database yeah. because then you have a large federation of uh, servers uh, which are starting and dying and going yeah. back which probably corresponds to microservice architecture in some regards um, it's really um, a difficult task to maintain a proper persistent connection with the yeah. database because it's like yeah. Uh, slightly uh, scary to do this. Uh, isn't it yeah. like more difficult in microservice environment uh, to deal with persistent connection, or maybe rather it it makes it easier? Or what do you think? Um, I think I understand why because the, the high number of connections, the high number of calls in a web environment, makes it very difficult to keep your connection lines open. And that's why you have something like PG Bouncer and shared server in, in the ancient Oracle world. Um, I uh, let me let, I'll, I'll declare myself not qualified to answer this further. But when we meet in person, we need a room with a whiteboard. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Sure. Definitely. Yeah. It's it's not so. It's a long way to go. Yeah. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, just about a twelve months. You know. Hope. Yeah, hope yeah. Uh, depends on our yeah. Yeah, 5G. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, going back to yeah. the question, can, can you rephrase it? I think we answered only half of it, and the other half I declare myself totally incapable to answer. Yeah, it's uh, d d does the microservices bring extra uh, difficulties to handle the uh, persistent connection to the database? Uh, the answer is yes. And you can mitigate that by, if you really know what you're doing, you can avoid some of that. But the, the, the problem is it remains. Ag against the ideology of microservices. You don't need to yeah. to know what you're doing if you're using microservices. Yeah. <laughs> true, true. But uh, if your microservice does a, a REST call or HTTP call or a whatever call, that the component on the receiving end of the call becomes hot. Yeah. yeah so. Yeah. Um, put this down as a topic for for next year's discussion or whenever meetup. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank you. And we almost run out of time. So uh, thank you, Piet. Uh, once again, a great talk. And oh, it's really so. nice oh. to have you at the PG Day Russia. Um, oh. Regret to say that's not offline. <laughs> <laughs> but... Oh well, don't worry. There is hope, you know. If, there if is the whole thing comes, comes better, I'll, I'll ride it. I'll bring my motorcycle to St. Petersburg maybe one day, please. Yeah, hopefully yeah. next year. Yeah, and... just come to think of the uh, the connection pool. The, the, the Yugabyte will uh, claim to be able to handle 5,000 connections just like that. Investigate that. Because um, we are not the only ones thinking about that problem, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. sorry. Good point. <laughs> uh, thank you. And uh, now uh, we are having some sort of lunch break. Mm -hmm. uh, once again, it's online lunch, so we're not uh, serving you a proper lunch, regret to say. But uh, we'll be yeah, glad to. Virtual, virtual uh, lunch. Yeah. And uh, we see you uh, approximately in one hour. Um, it would be. Yeah, we will be back uh, around 1 p.m by central european time that is 2 p.m moscow time so it's approximately an hour we will come back with our next speaker so, so yeah see you soon guys and girls see you and see you soon Bye.